Well, friends, I'm thrilled you chose to join us in worship. You know, at Bel Air Church, we've been around for 66 years, and not a lot of people know that we have a thriving Christian preschool on our campus. And actually, today's topic, today's sermon, actually, we'll get to talk about education. I get a lot of people come to me and say, what is the best environment for me and my family to be in? Is it a Christian education, or is it a public school or a non-Christian environment? Now, as somebody who is a parent of two boys, who I've experienced both the public school system and Christian schools, who uh, my youngest right now is in our preschool. In my own life, I've gone to Catholic schools and Christian schools and, and, and public schools. I think one thing that's more important than the environment is ultimately God and a relationship with God through Jesus Christ cultivated in a very intentional way. In the same way, walking into a garage doesn't make you a car, or walking in Dodger Stadium doesn't make you a Dodger baseball player. Walking into a church or walking into a Christian school doesn't necessarily make you a Christian. It's a matter of the heart. And as we will discover today, regardless of what environments you have opportunities to be in, or regardless of what comes at you in this world, there is something that can enable you to be faithful to God and to thrive and to grow and be used by God, ultimately to be faithful in the fires of life. That's what we're gonna talk about today. I'm very excited as we continue in worship. We're gonna sing, we're gonna pray, we're gonna to go to God's word out of the book of Daniel and stick around for the end of the service. I've got a special invitation for you. My name is Anderson, Isiago Anderson. I'm the new Director of Traditional Worship, and I've been worshiping in Bel Air since uh, 2017. What makes me a great worshiper, what makes me a humble child of God, uh, with the sinner that I am, is that I acknowledge my sins, acknowledge my shortcomings, and praise and worship God through those in my closet when there's no one watching. Worship to me is, is Seriously, it's a way of life. Worship is, it, it takes many forms, but whatever the form, I, I, I always want to make sure I do not miss the mark, which is that everything we do, all our singing, all our coming together, should give honor and give glory to God. The Father is seeking uh, those who worship Him in spirit and in truth. And this is the generation that should rise up and go beyond uh, go beyond uh, grandstanding and actually pour out our hearts to worship God. And that's why I love the ministry of Bel Air, Pastor Drew and all the uh, pastoral team. They are very, very uh, selfless. It, it's not about self. It's all focused on God and God alone. I heard the choir sing and I'm like, Lord, I would love to be a part of this church. That has been my start. Life is full of things that have the potential to incinerate our faith. They can destroy our love, our courage, our humility, our hope. 
Are these fiery trials meant to be avoided, feared, endured? Do they mean that God is absent? What if there was a way to not fear the fire or fight the fire, but to be faithful in the fire? What if the fires meant that God was actually near and not far? As we look back to the days of Daniel, we see people faithful in the fires of another kingdom, faithful in the fires of loss, faithful in the fires of worldly education, faithful in the fires of social conformity, faithful in the fires of discernment, faithful in the fires of success, and faithful in the fires of persecution. Could it be that the days of Daniel aren't too different than today and that God has a vision to meet us in the fires so that we can together be faithful in the fire? Well, as we continue on in this hour of worship, we're also, as a reminder, in the middle of a sermon series called Faithful in the Fire. Now, this third week, uh, if you missed the first two, you can get caught up after the service. Go to our YouTube channel, Baylor Church on YouTube, and uh, subscribe to us while we're there. And as we move throughout this series, if you miss any of them, you can get caught up at any point in time. And there is this overall picture that God gives us in the book of Daniel of how we can move through life, acknowledging that fires come. And I'm not talking about literal physical hot fires, I'm talking about metaphorical fires that are painful, that are intense, that have the potential to destroy us. And yet as we move throughout this series, we take a look at seven metaphorical fires that are found in the book of Daniel and how there is this remarkable truth for them and for us today that we don't have to fight the fires, we don't have to fear the fires, we don't have to avoid the fires, but we can be faithful in the fire. Now, as we go through each of these weeks, some of these topics are really hot topics, topics that are talked about, debated about, and we're going to get to one of those topics today. And I've been praying uh, in advance for this, that I would get out of the way, that God would clearly communicate through me. We'd love your feedback. We'd love to interact with you after this. Please reach out to me. My email, I'm just going to throw it out there, drew.sams at belair.org. We'd love for you to connect with me after the service to to give me your thoughts, to engage with this topic, because the topic today has to do with the fire of worldly education. Now, education is at the heart of the book of Daniel. In fact, you could say that education is King Nebuchadnezzar's strategy to annihilate the people of Israel. The historical reality the King Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful king on the planet, led the Babylonian Empire, the Babylonian army, to conquer the nation of Israel. And his strategy was to bring 10,000 professionals, leaders across every single industry, to bring them back to Babylon and to educate them in the ways of Babylonian life, of Babylonian culture, of religiosity, of spirituality, of Babylonian worldview. And the strategy of assimilation would essentially annihilate the nation of Israel, because they would forget who God was. They would forget their distinctiveness as a called out people to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They would begin to worship other gods, that they would begin to value other things. They would begin to see themselves through a Babylonian worldview. And it was Nebuchadnezzar's strategy. And education was at the heart of it. He knew that education could assimilate these influencers to influence the rest of the nation of Israel. But education was also at the heart of somebody else. Not just Nebuchadnezzar, but education was at the heart of Hananiah, the false prophet. You see, he believed that the strategy that the exiles needed to go down, that the road they needed to go down, was to separate themselves and to literally never allow the Babylonian worldview, to never allow any sort of worldly education hit their ears or infiltrate their minds. And so he began to say to the nation of Israel, whatever you do, stay away. Live on the outskirts of Babylon. Don't allow yourself to become assimilated. You need to stay separate. 
And his whole strategy was that the nation of Israel needed to stay in an enclave to protect, to secure, to fortify their thought life. Now, what's interesting, if you look at those as the only two options, I might imagine that you would say that Hananiah's strategy was the only way forward, the right way forward in order to preserve the Jewish faith, the only way forward to preserve their worldview, the only way forward to remember who God is and the life they are called into. However, there is a third way, and this is God's way. In fact, we can read about this in Jeremiah chapter 29. I talked about this in the first week. God gave Jeremiah God's vision. This was a true prophecy, not a false prophecy that Hananiah put out into the world. Uh, Jeremiah spoke, and in Jeremiah 29, 4 and following, it says this, God speaking to the exiles, the 10,000, I want you to move into Babylon. I want you to build houses. I want you to plant gardens. I want you to increase and not decrease. I want you to marry and have kids. I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. And I want you to pray for the city. I want you to seek its welfare. I want you to seek its peace because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Not Nebuchadnezzar's strategy of assimilation, not Hananiah's strategy of separatism. God's heart was for God's people to be in the world, but not of it. To be faithful to God, to be distinct to God, to have a very clear identity, and in some ways to have dual citizenship, that they would be citizens of heaven while citizens on earth. And this third way is a way that is so easily forgotten. We can fall into one of those two ways of thinking and forget the whole message of Jeremiah, the whole message of the book of Daniel that God invites us to a third way. And I want you to self-reflect and to ask yourself a question. Uh, when you consider your life, who would you say or what would you say influences your values more than anything else? Uh, is it your family of origin? Uh, is it the field of study? Is it your political party that you are drawn to? Uh, is it a worldview that perhaps you have? Or uh, is it a worldview given by God? Uh, is your uh, primary way that you view the world through a lens of Scripture? Now, as we ask those questions, that can invariably lead us still down two very different paths, a Nebuchadnezzar path or a Hananiah path. But Daniel caught the vision that God gave Jeremiah to faithfully follow God in the midst of a pagan culture, to faithfully follow God in the midst of receiving a worldly education. And what we see is remarkable. And as we take a look at Daniel's life, I pray that that gives us a remarkable vision for what our life can look like today. And we will discover that the figure in the fire is the key that unlocks this potential. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn with me to Daniel chapter 1. With that little bit of background, we're going to dive right in. We are starting from a similar passage of Scripture each week. And it says this, In the third year, this is Daniel 1, verse 1, In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord let King Jehoiakim of Judah fall into his power, as well as some of the vessels of the house of God. These he, this is Nebuchadnezzar, brought to the land of Shinar and placed the vessels in the treasury of his gods. Then the king commanded his palace master, Ashpenaz, to bring some of the Israelites, the royal family, and of the nobility, young men without physical defect and handsome, versed in every branch of wisdom, endowed with knowledge and insight and competent to serve in the king's palace. And they were to be taught the literature and language of the Chaldeans. This, my friends, the reading of God's word, as we say every week, thanks be to God. So here you have, as we have discovered week after week, that this group of 10,000, Within that 10,000, there are four named individuals. You can read about it actually in verse 6. It says, among them were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishnael, and Azariah. This is a different Hananiah than the false prophet, very different Hananiah. And ultimately, it says that they were to be educated for three years. This is verse 5. They were to be educated not in Jewish education, not in biblical teaching, but they were to be educated in the ways of the Chaldeans. 
And as we get into the book of Daniel, we begin to discover just what type of education this was. This was sorcery. This was divination. This is a pagan worldview that is the complete opposite of what God longs for us to guide our life, to, 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 to follow the ways of, of God, and ultimately for us in the New Testament era, to follow the ways of Jesus. And at first glance, you might think, what on earth is happening here? How could God allow this? And yet very clearly, as we read, this was all part of God's plan. Now, I, I have to fully acknowledge uh, that we can forget this reality when we think about Daniel. I've heard many times in my life that we need to dare to be like Daniel, that we lift up the fact that Daniel was so faithful to God, which he was. Uh, we lift up the fact that D Daniel refused to bow down and worship false gods and ultimately worship the one true God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We celebrate Daniel's faithfulness because Daniel was faithful, but often I believe we forget that God actually allowed him to be fully saturated, fully immersed in a pagan worldview. And this seems to, in many ways, as we've forgotten that and we've tried to, in the modern world, in the Western world, try to faithfully raise up the next generation, there is a movement within uh, Christendom as a whole that says the only way that we can be certain that people will ever grow up as people of faith is if we separate from the public school system is if we separate from private schools that are inherently Christ-centered and we pull them away and ultimately we have our own Christian schools. And now I completely understand why that is a really valid strategy because we also see in scripture that there is two different types of wisdom. There is worldly wisdom and there's godly wisdom. And scripture again and again and again and again says that worldly wisdom leads to folly. And so it's no wonder that Hananiah, the false prophet, would say, we need to avoid worldly wisdom at all costs. And I can see why there is a huge movement that says we need to pull our Christian kids out of schools that aren't inherently Christian and move them into, whether at home or in a school setting, into a distinctly uh, tight-knit, uh, protected uh, Christian worldview. However, Daniel models for us that there is a third way. And there is not one sliver of evidence in the entirety of the book of Daniel that I can see that Daniel compromises his faith in God. There's not one moment that he compromises his biblical worldview that even though he actually learns all about the Babylonian worldview, and is trained up over the course of three years and ultimately passes tests that enable him to succeed and to get promoted, ultimately to the place where the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, trusts him more than all the other uh, diviners and, and people of sorcery, who trusts Daniel more than all of them because he finds in him a man of wisdom. Now, the key here, I believe, is one verse. There's this one key uh, that unlocks this reality. And if you would take a look at verse 17 of Daniel chapter 1, and it says this, To these four young men, God gave knowledge and skill in every aspect of literature and wisdom. Daniel also had insight into all visions and dreams. Now, let's linger on this for a moment. Uh, let's break it down and just literally comprehend what is being said here. So verse 17, to these four young men, God gave knowledge. This is not earthly wisdom. This is godly wisdom. This is heavenly wisdom. The book of Proverbs says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. There is something that happens when you worship God, when you put your trust in God, when you acknowledge that God's ways are higher than our ways, when you pray, God, to give me a wisdom that lasts, that is more than knowledge, that just puffs up, but it is wisdom that leads to truth, that is uh, eternal, that there is this reality that God gave these four men godly wisdom. So clearly, everything that they learned was from God's perspective 
was God given. And yet, this is what at first seems so counterintuitive, which is the complete opposite of what Nebuchadnezzar wanted, the complete opposite of Hananiah the false prophet hoped for. It says this, in what areas did God give them wisdom and knowledge? It says this, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and skill in every aspect of literature and wisdom. The context in which they were learning the literature that they were learning from wasn't from scripture, wasn't of a Jewish worldview, wasn't a Hebraic understanding of the world. It was a Babylonian, a Chaldean. All the literature that they have was written by people who didn't acknowledge God as Lord and Savior, who didn't acknowledge God as the God of the Bible, who believed in other gods, who believed that humanity wasn't created in the image of God who didn't believe that the purpose that we have in life is to, to love God and to love our neighbors ourselves. And yet God gave these four men wisdom and knowledge in that literature. And at first you might say, well, what, what, what point are you making? Let me say this. The concept of fire is very helpful for me. Because ultimately, fire is something, literally, that, that burns up anything that is temporary. And if our uh, faith, for example, um, as we move out in the world, uh, is confronted with worldly wisdom, worldly education, there is the potential that worldly education can become a fire if it burns up our faith. In fact, I know many, many people. Some of them are friends. Some of them are former students who I knew. Some of them are, are, are people that I know as children who grew up in the church, grew up in the Christian faith. And at some point in their life, whether it was when they went off to high school or college or at some point as an adult, ultimately they abandoned their faith for a different worldview. And in many ways, in actually every way, I see that that faith in God that worldview that comes from Scripture uh, doesn't just m disappear, but ultimately is confronted by something else that consumes it. That a worldview is shift from one to the other. In other words, there is assimilation into the new environment. I've known people who have uh, gotten wrapped up, sadly, in cults. And the worldview of the cult has consumed like a fire their faith in the living God. I know some people who have gone off to college and began studying uh, science, and for them, in particular, I'll come back to this in a moment, uh, the worldviews of the scientific method and the scientific community have been like a fire that have consumed their faith. I know some people have moved out into the world, and secularism, a belief in uh, everybody's view is right, that we should be tolerant of all views, that that uh, what seems to be a very embracing, a very tolerant view on the outside has actually consumed their faith. And I know some people who, as they've gone to seminary, Christian seminary, to be equipped to be a pastor, have lost their faith. In fact, this has happened so frequently that some people actually refer to seminary as cemetery. It's a place where people's faith goes to die. And I think that it's very important for us to acknowledge that education as a whole has the potential, that's the key, has the potential to have the power to consume, to burn up our faith. And that's why Hananiah the false prophet was fearful of and believed that the strategy was you need to avoid that fire. And there's people today who believe that the fire of worldly education, whether that education comes in a school setting or comes through media, or comes through art, or comes through music. There is a view that I understand that says we need to avoid that fire. But the book of Daniel says that there is a, another way, a third way. It is Jeremiah's vision that Daniel lives out. And to come back to the literal file that's found in Daniel chapter 3. You remember, if you've been with us these weeks, there's this remarkable moment. And it's not a metaphor, it is an actual fire that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into. And I'm going to keep coming back to this 
actual fire because I believe it's a great metaphor for the metaphorical fires in Daniel, but also the other fires, and today especially, the fire of worldly education. You see, you've got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those were their Babylonian names. In fact, Daniel 1 says that alongside Daniel, as I read it before, there were those three, Hananiah, Mishnael, and Azariah, but they were given the names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were also given wisdom from God. They were given knowledge from God. They were called like Daniel to be leaders, to be part of the administration of the Babylonian empire, and yet they never compromised in their faith. They never compromised in their worldview because God gave them a knowledge, God gave them a wisdom that that uh, fire of worldly education never consumed. And yet there was a moment where they had a choice. Do we bow down and worship this 90-foot structure, this, this idol that King Nebuchadnezzar do we assimilate into this Babylonian worldview? Do we compromise our faith? Do we compromise our belief that there's only one true God? And ultimately, they were faced with a tremendous test. They had a choice. And King Nebuchadnezzar brings them in and says, I see that you have a bound out of worship. Therefore, you're going to be thrown into the fire. And they respond to King Nebuchadnezzar and they say, our God has the ability to save us. But even if he doesn't, we still won't bow down and worship this false idol. And so furious, Nebuchadnezzar orders the fire to be hot, hotter, uh, fired up seven times hotter than it normally is. And the uh, guards go to throw him in and in the haste they fall in, and get burned up. And ultimately Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego are thrown into this fiery furnace and something miraculous happens. Nebuchadnezzar leaps up in amazement, looks into the fire and sees not three, but sees four individuals unbound, walking in the middle of the fire. And the fourth one looks like a god. Something about the appearance of this fourth caused Nebuchadnezzar to realize this wasn't just some ordinary human being. And literally uses that language. This one looks like a God and remarkably brings the three out. The fourth one perhaps stays in the fire. The three come out, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and there is not a singe of fire on their hair, their clothing. Even their clothes don't even smell like smoke because the power of the fire didn't have the ability to consume them. And as we've been talking about every single week, this fourth figure all evidence points that this fourth figure isn't a human being, isn't just a God, but this is God in the flesh. This is a pre-incarnate appearance of the Son of God. In fact, this remarkable truth that it was actually Jesus who entered into that literal fire, that it was Jesus who met them in that literal fire, who set them free in that literal fire, who as Nebuchadnezzar looked, he saw them, not bound and dragged out and then set free outside the fire, didn't see this one like a God come and put out the fire or to cause them to not even fall into the fire, but actually met them in the midst of the fire and enabled them to have freedom and agency right in the middle of that fire in fellowship with that one. And it causes Nebuchadnezzar in response to say, this God, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is a God that saves unlike any other God. So the key is, is that this God, our God, the God of the Bible, Jesus the Christ, fully God, fully human, his strategy is to enter into the fires of our life, to meet us in the midst of it, and to hold us, to sustain us, to set us free, and ultimately allow us to experience something that Assimilation and separation would never allow us to experience. And so because Jesus met them in that literal fire, I believe that in the fire of worldly education, again, this is a metaphor, that fire, but it has the power to consume. That God met them in the middle of that fire, that God gave them wisdom in the middle of that fire, that God actually enabled them to be free in the middle of learning all these things about the Babylonian Empire, allowed them to be free in the midst of learning about sorcery and witchcraft that actually enabled them to be so free in the midst of all of that, that their faith 
was unaffected. Their faith was unsinged. Their faith and their relationship with God and their steadfastness to the truth of God, their rootedness and the trueness of who God is was unshaken, unincinerated. That they had this mental, intellectual, fireproofness that, that ultimately came from God that actually enabled them to thrive in the midst of this pagan worldview, in the midst of this pagan system. Now, the only way this could happen is if God met them in the midst of it. And the only way that this could happen is if they continued to cultivate a relationship with God, if they continued to cultivate growing in knowledge from God. And I believe, and though it's not explicit here, I believe that something that is so important for us to catch today existed for them that is the opportunity for us. And what existed for them is that, that as that fire of worldly education came, they never let go of God. That God met them in the midst of all those classes, all those trainings, perhaps in the midst of all those tests, that I believe that there was never a moment, never a lesson, never a study that they did apart from their relationship with God. I believe long before they were brought into captivity, long before there were exiles in Babylon, they were trained up in the ways of the Lord. You see, the Jewish worldview in the ancient world really has been lost among the predominant number of Jewish people around the globe today. I think the closest thing would be uh, strictly devout Orthodox Jews who spend much of their days, who spend much of their life studying Scripture. And all the historical documents point that throughout the, the nation of Israel at this era, it's all they talked about. They spent time talking about God, telling the stories of his faithfulness. They came back to the Shema of Deuteronomy that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Teach this to your children day and night. Bind it on your foreheads. Write it on your doorposts. In everything that you do, acknowledge the Lord. And so they didn't have a separation in their life of sacred and secular. They didn't have, you know, Jewish education, and then we're going to kind of package that up and leave that aside and then move out in the world. Every moment of every day as they ate, as they drank, as they laughed, as they prayed, as they danced, as they grieved, as they were confronted with different worldviews, God was inviting them to see everything through a biblical, godly lens. And so they had had that for perhaps years. We believe that perhaps they were teenagers when they were called into the service of the Babylonian king. But as they entered into, if I could say it this way, as they entered into experiencing the effects of the fire of worldly education, in their case, the Babylonian worldview, there was something that was so strong in their life. And it was the wisdom of God that came from a relationship with God, that came from cultivating that relationship through prayer, through the study of God's word, through being in God-centered community, there was something that was so strong that even the fires of Babylonian education couldn't burn it up. And as a result, they never compromised. As a result, they were able to be respected by everybody in the Babylonian administration, ultimately all the way up to the Babylonian king. And there was moments like this where they had to make a choice. Do we compromise our faith in God and allow a Babylonian worldview, or even the uh, reality that we might die if we stay faithful to God? Do we compromise there and ultimately even up to the point of death, knocking on their door, they stayed faithful. And that's why we're calling this sermon series, Faithful in the Fire. And as we think about today, I think there is a great opportunity as individuals, and as we think about the next generation, that rather than fight the fire of the public school system, rather than uh, fight the fire of worldly education, rather than picketing against uh, anything that is non-Christian in media or in music or in art, you see, that's Hananiah, the false prophet's strategy. He says that everything that isn't from the Lord is evil, and therefore we should say separate. What God says to Jeremiah is, 
It is evil. It's not from my heart. And yet I'm calling you to go into it, deeply holding a relationship with me so that I can use you to transform it. You see, there's always this debate. As Christians interact with culture, uh, do we fight against it? Do we avoid it? Do we just become part of it? And sadly, when you look around uh, the American church, when you look around uh, Christianity as a whole, on some hand, in some cases, Christians look just like the rest of the world. There's a lot of studies that have come out that say uh, divorce rates, pornography usage, uh, addiction actually is generally the same among certain groups of Christians compared to the rest of the world. And in those cases, they've fallen into, I'll say it this way, King Nebuchadnezzar's strategy that we've become assimilated into the ways of the world. And God is grieved when we lose our distinctiveness, when we look down upon others like the world looks down upon, when we can't love our neighbor as ourself, when we begin to be judgmental like the rest of the world, when we begin to treat people like objects, when we trample on God's creation, all we've done is we've assimilated, we've forgotten God and God's way of life. But also we see across Christendom, there are people who do the complete opposite, who retreat, who say, you know, the only people we should ever be in a relationship with are fellow Christians. The only people who we should ever give their business to is Christians. The only music we should ever listen to is Christian music. The only films we should watch would be Christian, that that there is this desire. And in many ways, the complete opposite of King Nebuchadnezzar, this is a, I'll call it a Hananiah, the false prophet way of interacting with the world. The key is to acknowledge that all worldly education, it's a fire. To acknowledge that prevents us from being assimilated to it. To realize that there's actually tremendous danger in worldviews that don't come from the heart of God. There's tremendous danger that comes from worldviews that aren't reflected in Scripture. That's a huge leap for some of us to acknowledge that different worldviews are actually dangerous, that they are the tantamount to a raging fire. And I know that that might be offensive to some, but as I look at Scripture, there is no way else to parse it. Worldly education is a fire that will consume all that which isn't from the heart of God. Now, in some ways, some Christians have experienced their faith burning up And I believe that in those cases, and I think about some people that I know that I went to seminary with, and it was a cemetery for them, the faith that was burned up actually was something that was temporary to begin with. It wasn't a relationship with God that was cultivated in prayer, cultivated through studying God's word, cultivated by being in Christ-centered community. They came to seminary with a faith that ultimately was based on religiosity. It was faith that was based on a very narrow interpretation, perhaps on just a small part of Scripture, that ultimately had nothing to do with the relationship with God that they experienced meeting them in the midst of seminary, where in seminary you get a lot of different theological views. For many of them, they were completely shaken and their faith was completely incinerated because they couldn't quite navigate a variety of viewpoints as is natural in a theological setting. And there is this temptation to try to retreat, to try to separate. And ultimately, God says, I have a bigger vision for your life. As it says in Jeremiah 29, for I know the plans I have for you, plans for you not to perish, but to prosper. That is a great life verse for so many people, but very few people know its context. This isn't just a a life verse that is thrown out so people can catch and say, well, Great, God knows the plans, and I'm going to prosper. Great, what do I want to prosper in? Great, God's going to make it happen, and I'm never going to perish. The context of that prophecy through Jeremiah was, even though you will enter into the fires of the Babylonian culture, even though you're going to experience loss, even though you're going to try to be assimilated into this kingdom of this world, even though you're going to be inculcated and saturated with worldly wisdom coming from the Babylonians, even though you're going to experience success, even though you're going to experience social conformity, all these fires, I know the plans I have for you. 
plans for you to prosper, and plans for you to be part of transforming the Babylonian culture from the inside out. You see, if Daniel and his three friends, if they stayed separate, like Hananiah and the false prophet's plan was, they would never enter in a relationship with King Nebuchadnezzar, and ultimately King Nebuchadnezzar, his faith in the Babylonian gods would never change to a faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the faith of Scripture, which is actually what happens. There is a transformation that happens from the highest levels of leadership, and it begins to spread throughout the Babylonian Empire. People become faith-filled followers of the God of the Bible. And if they were separate, that would never happen. In the same way, in this world, in every company, in every school, in every political office, uh, on every set, really in every environment, there is an opportunity to faithfully follow God's call into those places to be used by God for the transformation of that culture. And if we choose to stay separate, we never have an opportunity to be in relationship with our coworkers, with our boss, with people that are in our life. We never get to be in relationship with fellow classmates of different worldviews. We never have an opportunity to talk to neighbors who come from different walks of life. And if we stay separate, God never can use us for the transformation that God longs for across this city and around the globe. But on the other hand, if we blindly go into these settings, and if we don't cultivate and hold on to and allow God to hold on to us, to meet us in the midst of those settings, if we don't spend hours and hours throughout the week in Christ-centered communities, studying God's word, practicing the way of Jesus, spending time in prayer, as we do those things, we can begin to forget and the fire of worldly education and worldly worldviews will consume us and we will assimilate into the culture and in the same way that God can't use us if we are separate, if we look just like and act just like everybody else, if we don't have a distinctiveness, if we don't see a called outness in but not of, in the same way we'll never be used by God to actually transform the environments in which we live. And so constantly we are falling off this razor's edge ridgeline, either in a separation or assimilation, and Jesus is saying, come follow me. I want to give you wisdom from God in all these areas of the world. And I want to use you in the sciences. I want to use you in entertainment. I want to use you in art. I want to use you in public policy making. I want to use you in education to be an agent of truth, of love, of joy, of peace, of patience, of kindness, of grace, reflecting my heart to a world that desperately needs it. You see, Hananiah believed that the only way that they could move forward is that they got back into power across all the cultural institutions. And yet God called them out of power into becoming a minority within the Babylonian empire. And this theology of suffering, this theology of being in but not of, this theology of the cross actually says that God's power can be made perfect in weakness that God's power can be made from the inside out like yeast that is small at first and grows, like a seed that begins to grow and ultimately take over the world, that a rock that starts small that ultimately becomes a mountain and covers the globe, that these things that are talked about in Daniel can be true for us today. God wants us to be deeply engaged in every aspect of society. But, big but here, it starts with deeply cultivating a relationship with God. If you don't have roots in God, you will get uprooted immediately. If you don't have that deep, abiding, ongoing cultivation of a relationship with God, the fires of this world will consume you alive. But again, a reminder that what Jesus offered them is what Jesus offers us today. 
Jesus longs to meet us in the midst of worldly education, in the midst of worldly influence, so that we would be unbound, walking in the middle of it for God's glory and for the flourishing of others. Now, I'm talking about more than just uh, formal school education, because in reality, anything has the possibility of education. So this includes media, this includes entertainment, this includes the arts, this includes really everything. And so in many ways, to be truly separate is only a temporary strategy. If we hide our kids and try to keep them in a bubble, ultimately, something from the world is going to creep in. And if we've based their entire faith on the temporariness, perhaps of not cultivating a relationship with God that has the fireproofness of everything in the world, the moment we step out in the world, the moment we watch a non-Christian film, the moment we stop listening to Christian music, those fires will decimate, incinerate their faith. And so here's what I'm clearly not saying. I'm not advocating that Christian education is a bad thing, nor am I ad advocating that everybody should send their kids to, to public school. I'm not advocating any of that. What I'm advocating is regardless of the options that you have in your life, whether it's a Christian school or a non-Christian school, that you wouldn't fear the fires of the world, that you would realize that they are powerless in the face of the powerful God who meets you, who offers himself to you, who longs to cultivate a relationship with you. And when you begin with that, when you begin with a relationship with God, Cultivating it, growing it, spending time in God's Word, joining a life group, asking questions, joining Discover Bel Air and discovering more about this Christ-centered community, spending time in, in the Word and growing in God's knowledge, there's something that God will give you that will sustain you, protect you, no matter what the world throws at you. There's a great opportunity we have to not fear the fires of education, to not avoid them, to not fight them, but to be faithful in the midst of them. That starts and ends and only continues through a completely growing and fireproof relationship with Jesus. It's my prayer for you. Let's live it out this week and every week. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you, all throughout scripture, have called people to be faithful witnesses, ambassadors of you in the world. Not only do I think about Daniel, I think about Esther. I think about the Apostle Paul going to Athens and being used by you, God, in Athens to ultimately lead people to Christ. May we be people that don't fear the world, but may we also have a sober perspective that the world has the potential to incinerate our faith, unless it's a faith in you, a faith that lasts because you last. Would you meet us in the midst of our fires? Would you give us a strength and a wisdom that only comes from you? And would the people in our life ultimately come to a saving relationship in you, God, the maker of heaven and earth? In Jesus' name I pray and we say together, amen. Thanksgiving is a time of the year to be grateful. And it's a special tradition when families gather around the table where there is love and laughter and a lot of food. But it's even more special when a foster family can provide that type of experience to children in their care. So the Thanksgiving Boxes of Love um, is a way of supporting our foster families and to say thank you to them for opening up their hearts and homes for children in need. Foster All has been partnering with Bel Air Church for close to 30 years now. We like to say in our world, there's always room at the table for one more. At uh, Harvest Home every year, we receive a couple of Thanksgiving boxes and we actually prepare the meal on site and serve it to our, our residents and our alumni who often come back. And so to be able to have the blessing of that, that family um, gift together, that family dinner together is really special for um, both our residents, alumni and our staff. So I had just transitioned out of Harvest Home and I was living in a studio apartment with my daughter. 
um, and uh, have a box of stuffing and, and a turkey and um, things to make for my own family was really, it was really special and nice. So when I think about this year, I'm really excited because we just opened this new home, which means we're serving more women, more families, have more of an impact. It's been such a milestone year. So to have Bel Air partnering with us this year to provide those Thanksgiving boxes is really special. Hi there, Bel Air. My name is Charlotte Jameson, and I've had the honor of seeing firsthand the impact that Bel Air Church has made in our community through our Thanksgiving boxes. Last year alone, we were able to assemble and deliver more than 1,300 Thanksgiving boxes. As you've heard from our partners, the blessing of the Thanksgiving boxes is life-changing for many families. I'm thrilled to announce in November, we will continue our Thanksgiving boxes tradition here at Bel Air, but we need your help. Would you write a prayer and mail it to Bel Air Church? What better way to connect with people receiving the Thanksgiving boxes than by receiving a handwritten prayer written directly from you? Another way you can help is by coming in person in November to help pack and or deliver Thanksgiving boxes. You will have the opportunity on that day to meet others in our community, as well as serve our community all around the Los Angeles area. For more information, go to bellar.org forward slash events. Finally, this can't happen without you and your financial support. Our goal this year is $50,000 to help those in need. Take one minute with me to imagine. Imagine yourself at a table full of turkey and all the fixings. Now imagine if everyone watching right now gave $50, which is the cost of a single Thanksgiving box. As you sit with your friends and family, up to 10 people will be doing the same thing because of your generous donation. With your financial support, we will continue to feed over 10,000 people in and around Los Angeles. Would you go now to belair.org forward slash give? You'll see a drop down menu which includes the words Thanksgiving boxes. Will you serve others with us by following Jesus every day, everywhere, with everyone?
Well, friends, before we wrap up, this is something that I hold near and dear to my heart as a father, as a pastor, as somebody that longs to follow Jesus in every area of our lives. And I think more important than outsourcing education and outsourcing the teaching of worldviews just to schools and just to teachers and just to other people, the opportunity is for us to take charge of discipling the next generation. For me to know that it's an opportunity for me as a parent to instill in my kids a Christ-centered groundedness in God's Word so that regardless of the environments that they find themselves in, that they can walk with Jesus. We want to equip you on that journey. Whether you are a parent or single, no matter who you are in life, we're called to follow Jesus in this world. Many resources are available on our website, as you follow us on social media, as you subscribe to our YouTube channel, but also know we've got an opportunity in some ways to follow Jeremiah's vision to care for the city in which we live. And we are entering the Thanksgiving season and you can be a part of it. Even if you've never been to our physical campus, even if you live outside of Los Angeles, we have a goal to feed 10,000 people this Thanksgiving, this year, in the city of Los Angeles. It's a city that we love. It's the city that God has called us to. Many of you, you live within this city. So you could go to belair.org forward slash events. See all the information about Thanksgiving boxes. If you choose to come onto our campus to help assemble those boxes, wonderful. You'll meet some great people while you're here. But also, you don't have to come to our physical campus. You can give. You can pray. You can actually contribute, not financially, towards these boxes as well. All the information is found at bellar.org forward slash events, just to reiterate it again. And I would love everybody who considers Bel Air their church home. That's you. If you're watching this service, I hope that you consider Bel Air your church home. We love you. We're praying for you. We want you to get involved this year with Thanksgiving boxes. You can do that from the comfort of your own home. You can come to our campus. Again, for the last time, bellair.org forward slash events. All the information is there. And join us next Thanksgiving as we serve our great city of Los Angeles. May God bless you in the week ahead.